Hello, welcome everyone. My name's Angela. And before we really get into the heart of things, uh, I'm gonna turn it over briefly to the director of DVR, Dwayne Mays. Dwayne, go ahead. Thank you. So I, I wanted to let you all know that, uh, so I am fluent in sign, but I, uh, you know, if I talk in sign at the same time, which I tend to do, you butcher one language or you butcher both languages. So I'm just gonna go ahead and speak. And I apologize if I move my hands, but uh, I grew up in a deaf household, mom and dad deaf. So I do that on a regular basis. It has it bode well for me in my career. I'm really impressed with this. Uh, when I saw that this was being put together, I was really wowed by it. So this week, is a huge week with deaf awareness. And in the state of Alaska, we're doing a three-day conference where we have a lot of people that have registered. And I've been involved in the planning committee. Gina has been involved in that as well. And it's pretty, pretty significant. There's gonna be a whole slew of topics that will be covered over those three days. This is where I really want it to be. This is uh, what excites me. So when I saw the name of the panelists uh, that are gonna be uh, asked questions, I couldn't wait to get here to be a part of this. So I, I will kind of sit back and enjoy. I think I, I made some popcorn, I might eat some popcorn and really enjoy uh, these professionals. So to Daniel Har, who is a research analyst with the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, to Angela, Gray, who is the Rehabilitation Counselor for the Deaf, Hard of Hearing, Deaf Blind, to Gina Bastine, who is the uh, statewide coordinator for the Deaf and a regional manager for our division, and to uh, our lovely staff interpreter, Ryan Scort, uh, who has been with us for some time now. We believe that we have done quite well to make sure that we have all the resources to do quality service delivery for those that are deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. So can't tell you how excited I am. So I'm gonna sit back and enjoy this. So thank you, Angela. Thank you. Angela speaking. Um, and as Dwayne said, yes, I am the vocational rehabilitation counselor for the Anchorage area. I specialize in working with individuals who are deaf, uh, hard of hearing and deaf blind. I also sign, um, but for the sake of everybody's sanity today, myself and interpreters included, I'll be voicing for myself. Um, so uh, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. This is the first ever employment panel that DVR has been able to host for Deaf Awareness Week. And we're very excited to be able to share that with you. Um, this year, we're sharing with you the career paths of prominent deaf professionals. So joining us today, we have professionals from all over the country. Um, and I wanna do a special shout out, thank you, since he just spoke to our director, Dwayne Mays, as well as our statewide coordinator for deaf and hard of hearing services, uh, Gina Bastine, for their support in helping this to happen. Um, so my name is Angela Gray, Angela, um, and joining me today, we have Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Har. Thank you all for joining us today. And our goal of having this panel is really to get everybody acclimated and get used to exposing other professions that some of our deaf and hard of hearing consumers might not have been exposed to before. So these events is really just to get to know each other, what's happening here in Alaska and outside of Alaska. We have four people who have been invited. We have Noel King, Jeremy Sebes, McLean Drake, and Jason Jackson, and myself. So we're very excited to learn from each of you and your stories, how you were raised, your experiences that you've gone through navigating this world. And 
We will have six questions in total for each of you. You have three minutes to answer each question. If you need to expand a little bit more, if we're on topic of something, we might ask you to expand. And then if we have enough time at the end, we will open up question and answers to our audience, which you will then be able to put your questions into the chat. All right, Angela speaking. So a few items of housekeeping. Um, the, if you haven't noticed the video and audio of our audience has been turned off, it will remain off. Um, as you can see, this, uh, panel is being interpreted, it's being recorded and it's being transcribed. So you can access all of those services if you need them. Uh, we will be monitoring chat. So we do ask anyone participating in chat to please be nice, please be respectful and please be courteous. Um, if you have questions, please hold them until we announce that we are doing the question and answer section. If you post your question before that time, we cannot promise that we will be able to cycle back and get to that. So please hold questions until the end. Um, we will be answering as many questions as we can with the time that we have allotted. Um, when our panelists and even us as hosts are um, Speaking, we're going to be announcing our name first, and then if we have a comment to make while someone else is talking, we will raise our hands and the MCs will call on those who um, have raised their hand in the order that we see them raised. Um, so for our panelists, any questions before we get started? All good. A whole lot of thumbs up. Wonderful. We're going to keep it as is for now, doing a little bit of clarifying between our hosts. So, Jeremy, just to let you know, we're going to be switching the order, and you are going to be last in our order of answering questions. All right. And Jeremy says, All right. The first question that we are going to ask is for Noelle. Let me get my paper here. So do you mind giving us a little bit about yourself? Can you introduce yourself, what you do, how long you've been doing it? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Noelle King. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I My visual description, I'm a Korean American with short hair, blonde on one side, brown, black on the other side. I have a gray uh, sweater on and a black blouse. My background is blurred. Um, I'm in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I'm, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I work as an art therapist and mental health counselor at the Learning Center for the Deaf in um, Walden, Walden School. So I focus mainly with children from 8 to 21 years old who struggle with mental health issues, who have experienced trauma, and I work with them. It's, I love the, my work. I've been here for about a year. My major was in art therapy. I've been doing it for 10 years, and I enjoy it very much. The question, I work with children, it's amazing because children are very resilient. They've gone through some amazing trauma as deaf children, and they're open to learning new things. I'm very inspired by them. They teach me as much as I teach them. I've always learned from them. Uh, I work with deaf adults in the past. I have worked with deaf adults in the past, and I worked um, with in graduate school in Chicago as a day mental health uh, therapist um, from ages 30 to 80 years old. Uh, I worked as a main, at a mainstream school for deaf children, K through eight grades. Uh, I've worked in a variety of uh, situations with a variety of ages. Uh, I was working in San Diego, California. I worked with a lot of deaf and hard of hearing people who had drug and alcohol issues. I worked with as a therapist with them at the same time as a mental health um, coach. Uh, so I've run the gamut for all sorts of um, working with people. Wow, this is Daniel. That is a wonderful story. 
Do you have any questions to add to her? No, this is Angela speaking. And no, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel. Uh, this is our second panelist here. So I have to look at my paper, one second. Okay. So my name is Daniel Parr, and I was born and raised in Romania. I moved from Romania when I was 17, and I had moved to LA, Los Angeles, California. Most of the what happens in Romania is kids go through kindergarten through eighth grade. And once they're deaf or hard of hearing children, don't go to high school. They go to ninth through 12th grade in a vocational rehabilitation or vocational studies. And that is where I learned how to do woodworking and carpentry and how to make different projects that I would then bring home. So here's an example. Wow. <clears throat> this was my you. first project. This is Angela speaking. I'm going to put you on hold real quick. We have a request in the chat that the interpreters have their videos on so that um, their lips can be read. Thank you. So this is one of the projects that I had made. So moving to Los Angeles and was there for about 15 years, worked and went to school, went to California State University, Northridge. And then I moved over to Northridge or moved to Utah where I was working in Sorensen for communication services. And I moved to Alaska back in 2020. And I've been working for the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation I think it's a year today. It's been one year today. It's my one year anniversary. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. And this is Angela, and we have been so happy to have him this last year. He has really brought a lot to our team. Um, so we are just thrilled that we get to keep Daniel. <laughs> so Daniel, I'm now going to pass this over to one but to McLean. McLean. So if you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do and how long you've been doing it. And McLean, before you start, um, RIT people can, thank you. I just saw that they're on it. So we're good. McLean, go ahead. Of course. Hello, I am McLean Drake. It's a pleasure to meet all of you and uh, get to be on this panel. Um, I I guess start out, I was born with my hearing loss. Uh, my mother and I and my brother have the same form of hearing loss, which is a reverse slope neurological sensory hearing loss, uh, which is very uncommon for most kids. And I've worn hearing aids ever since I remember, which is about two and a half years old. Went through intense speech classes, worn a little bit ASL, and uh, it's my reality ever since I was born. So. This is, uh, it's always fun now that I'm now in this industry. Uh, then in high school, I did a lot of musical theater, which then led me into acting and modeling before I went into what I'm now known, which is I specialize in concerts for people who are deaf and hard of hearing and other disabilities alike. And uh, I work with companies to help them advance their technologies for concerts, for bigger, uh, bigger events, whether it be live performances, to TV, to film, um to movie theaters and such and so i have a lot of partnerships within that to help push the needle to bring more accessibility and more awareness to the issues that are at these bigger scale events rather than things like classrooms and such so i work a lot with the deaf and blind schools all across utah uh, i'm based in utah so that's where i got my foot in the door um, and i've been doing concerts now for i believe six years uh, so I, whether that's I invest in the concerts and I do all the accessibility side, 
or I'm actually throwing everything with the concerts, like booking the talent and such. Uh, I do it all in the music scene, and uh, it's a very daunting task, and not a lot of people get that privilege, so I'm very humbled to be able to do that and do some impact in that way. Um, and then now, more recently, more people have asked me to do more film work because there's a lot more films that are happening for that include the deaf and hard of hearing or deaf blind or and such. Uh, so I work with children all the way to adults on um, different various things across all those terms. And so that's the, everything I do in a nutshell and uh, very privileged. And I, I, the only other thing I can think of is uh, I have a partnership with Sonova uh, where I help them out with all their future hearing aids and sometimes cochlear implants and headphones that they may come out with. And I've been doing that with them for now three years. And so I do a lot of public speaking for them and other organizations. So I imagine it'll come up along the way, but regardless, pleasure meeting you all and uh, grateful for the conversation going forward. This is Angela speaking and wonderful. Thank you, McLean. Thank you, McLean. And now, Jason, let's pass this over to you. How long have you been doing and who are you? Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Jackson talking. Um, I work for Sorensen. I've been there for about 18 years um, as a director. I work, I'm in charge of California, Oregon, and he prefers, okay. And um, in Washington. And Washington uh, State. Let's see. Um, I also have, work with a travel agency. It's called Heart cruises. Um, uh, this is my, I will be going on my 28th cruise next month. Uh, hopefully I'll retire soon and just travel full time. Uh, that's all about me. Wonderful. Thank you, Jason. Which is your favorite place or most fun that you have gone on a cruise working for the cruises? Both. Uh, Thorinson gives me the opportunity to travel and I meet so many people. Uh, so I really love both jobs. Uh, I've worked from home for 18 years as well. So that's my opportunity to take advantage of. And now we're going to pass it to our last panelist, Jeremy. Do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Hello, everyone. My name is Jeremy. See best. And I had grown up in a mainstream program. Grew up in Pennsylvania. Grew up in Pennsylvania and graduated from RIT all the way through my college career and then got my degree and then moved on to working for a variety of companies related to graphic design. And that kind of mainstreamed into graphic design led into some transition into the federal government. And I have been working there for about 10 years in Washington, DC and have bounced around to a couple different agencies like Center for Disease Control, the CDC, and also for the Department of Homeland Security. And I have transitioned back now to California and I've been here since 2016. And my wife and I have moved here so we could live together and I have two children. And we have been here and kind of working from home since COVID, so. Wow, this is Angela speaking, and thank you all so much for joining us. I am so excited for everything that you guys bring to our table and the stories that you guys are going to be able to share with all of our audience. That's amazing. So question number two, and we're going to um, try to keep with the same order each time. So um, kind of how you see things is, is how it will be. It'll be Noel, Daniel, McLean, Jason, Jeremy for each question. Um, so question number two, first to Noel. 
Um, how did you get into your field? What inspired you to um, become a therapist and specifically a music therapist? Art therapy, my apologies. This is Angela, my apologies, I misspoke and I knew that too. <laughs> that's all right, that's all right. Um, I am a art therapist. If you can see her, she's frozen for me. Give me a minute. So I got into art therapy. So I'll just add a little bit about my background. I got, I'm from South Korea, moved here to America when I was about four months old. I uh, have deaf parents and we moved to, to Arkansas. Arkansas. I went to a deaf school. I really enjoyed art from a very early age and really majored in art and the different types of art and tried to figure out where a opportunity would come that would provide my passion for art to be included. So do I sell art? I wasn't really sure. Graphic design was an idea as well. Uh, computers are not really my thing. So just really trying to get into what I would find my passion in and I found psychology. And I went to Gallaudet University and fell in love with both art and psychology. And so I was like, how can I bring these two together? And so doing art is therapeutic. So I thought I could mix their psychology with my art. And for deaf individuals who are visual learners, it felt like it was a really good, and I believed it was a really good way of expressing your ideas and your feelings through art. And then you would also be able to do psychology at the same time. And so I did go to I went to the Art Institute of Okay. Let me try let me try going forward. Art okay. Institute of Chicago is where I went. There we go. Okay. So um I majored in art therapy, and that's where my perspective changed about deaf people. They're, they go to mental health counseling, but they're very limited in having hearing therapists. So I'm wondering if uh, I could incorporate visual art, and then I proceeded with that. So now um, the, I'm going to Leslie University to get my both all my art therapy, music therapy, it, it incorporates all sorts of therapies. I'm hoping I answered your question. This is Angela speaking, and yes, marvelously so. And in my own defense, I must have known that you were trying to study music and dance because that's immediately where my mind went. So I was just anticipating that you were going to be adding those to your resume. <laughs> so thank you very much, Noel. Uh, McLean, same question to you. How did you get into your field and what inspired you? Well, that's a very interesting thing. Um, I think a lot of it stemmed from, so I was doing acting at the time and somebody asked me to be in one of their films and we needed a film location. I'm very good with reaching out and I just love talking to people. And I didn't talk a lot about my hearing loss. Or, uh, growing up, I just kind of, kept it to myself because I grew up in the very mainstream world. So a lot of people didn't really understand like my hearing loss. Even I didn't fully understand kind of what a reverse flow of neurological sensory didn't understand all that. I just was content with life. And uh, the venue location we actually acquired was a venue for music. So it did for live shows and EDM and lots of loud music. And I was like, well, I love this place. So I, I could, I'll become good friends with the owner. So I became good friends with the owner of the venue and me and him got along so well that we, he would invite me to shows all the time. And so a little bit further down the line, me and him were talking one day 
and he asked, well, aren't these shows really crazy? And I think, yeah, no, I mean, they're crazy, but they're, it's just, if I had more of a hearing loss, if I didn't grow up mainstream, I wouldn't understand, I wouldn't enjoy this because I don't understand what all these lights and visuals, like they just don't go with the music. And, and I understand that because even I just know I can enjoy it because I'm very fortunate in that way. And he was like, well, then why don't we throw a show? The only thing is, is I don't know how to reach out to the deaf or hard of hearing community. I don't want to come off as sensitive, but since you have a hearing loss, you can do it in a way that if it speaks to you, then probably other people would connect. And so he let me rent out the venue for free, didn't charge me anything. He just loved the whole concept. It just was all on me. And at the time I had nothing, no experience with throwing shows. So I was like, that's not what I signed up for, but I'm more than willing and why not? And I've never seen a show that's been catered for hearing loss, uh, at least in Utah, or at least when I was doing it at the time. And so I reached out to the deaf community, like, hey, I want to do this. There's people that want to collaborate with me. I'm open to it. I have no preferences. I will do the things I like. And so from there, uh, I just learned how to do everything from the ground up. I learned how the visual stuff works all the way to sound engineering. And then I got into making like experimenting with vibrations. So then that way it didn't rely just on sound. We can take sounds and make it into the vibrations. And I learned how to weld because I just I just really loved the whole concept and, and the deaf community out here really wanted more shows and they're very expressive of that. And they were more than willing to, you know, let me and have me learn things and I'm all about learning and and then listen technology is one of my close uh, collaborations of a company, they let me use all their accessibility technology for live shows because nobody would do live shows. So they couldn't test out accessibility. And so then I asked if I can learn all of their accessibility. So a lot of my experience and what I've learned from doing shows or anything with the deaf community or deaf school events or anything along those lines, is just me wanting and desiring to learn. So then I knew what I was putting out there was the best product and there wasn't a better solution because I didn't like the idea that I was coming off if I was doing it for money or for the wrong reasons. I just care about solving the issues. Uh, it isn't uh, because I, I, I know that if I don't do it, it doesn't seem like a lot of other people are given that opportunity either. And it's a very hard thing that we run into is that people don't listen to our concerns. And so from there, I just learned how to do all the other industries and learned all the agents, to broke all the talent. So now people come to me. So I, a lot of what I experienced with anything show business related is networking and effectively explaining what I would like and how I can help the company out in a way and always just wanting to learn what new technology is coming out there. It's the same thing with Nova whenever I do work with them. Um, we have a relationship where I will be honest with the, with the feedback that the community feels from technology they're releasing because I don't want to be selling their product if it doesn't actually solve anything or if it's only to suck money out of us and it really doesn't solve any of the issues or it's not a better hearing aid or anything. So my, that is how I got into my field is just been very transparent that I'm here to solve the issue and people like to work with someone and pay someone who actually just wants to solve and learn and make more effective products, not just be a face and not solve the underlying issues. So I, I think that's the best way. I mean, I imagine there's more, more things, but I, that's, I will lend my experiences to that as my experience. So. Wonderful. This is Angela and yeah, no specific training, but life experience and trial by fire. That's great. Thank you for sharing your story. All right, Jason, please tell me, how did you get into your field and what inspired you to join your field? Well, um, I've, you know, technology became available a while back. So I took the opportunity to uh, follow a technician. I never thought I would ever work for Sorensen um, before I was a client advocate for a nonprofit organization. I worked for the IRS. I worked for the uh, Walmart, all sorts of different retail stores. 
And then Mark Call came to my home and gave me my very first video phone processor. Um, and he said, why don't you go ahead and set it up? And then from there, I got the job. I was hired to, and I've been working there with Sorensen for 18 years now. It's, and that's how long I've been there. I've never thought that was not, you know, I would keep my, my mind open to different opportunities out there. And I just went with the wind, go with the flow. And I love my job. Uh, and that's where I am now. Perfect. Angela speaking. Thank you, Jason. And I broke my own rule. I said we were going to go and order. And I completely forgot Daniel. <laughs> yes, who's sitting you right did. next to me. I was wondering I'm about staring that. at the screen up here and I'm not looking to my left. So, Daniel, because you were supposed to be number two and now you're what, one, two, three, four. Please tell me, how did you get into your field and what inspired you to get into your field? So growing up in a deaf family, it's very natural to be curious. We had communication within our family. In Romania, we use Romanian Sign Language to communicate, and that was all great. But when you leave your home and go to school or hanging out with your friends who are hearing, everybody's talking and you're trying to follow the conversation, and somebody would start laughing, and I'd be curious enough to ask, what are you talking about? Or what, what's happening? And so that internal curiosity has stuck with me all the way through. Moving to America was a huge culture shift, trying to learn English. I was 17 years old. I didn't know English from Romania. That wasn't something that we learned or practiced. So not having high school and then coming here and trying to get into California State University Northridge CSUN, it was all a learning experience for me. And one year, my roommate there at the dorms at CSUN brought in a computer. And I was looking at that and I'm like, what is that? He's like, oh, it's a computer. And so he was showing me some of the things we could do with it. And I opened it up and looking at the inside parts of what the computer looks like. And at that time, internet was just starting to be born. So like 92 to 94. And so trying to figure out what's the internet? How does this connect to that? What does this look like? And really being able to figure it out and between the two of us, ask questions, program different things, trying to search for different things, um, links. I mean, we're going all the way back to the start of internet and people started to kind of depend and learn so much information from the internet. And being able to have those opportunities to learn and then people started coming up to me saying I don't know what to do with my computer and so I'm like okay I'll show you how to use it and kind of started to find more information if I didn't know the answers to the questions that they were asking and so that internal curiosity is what really inspired me to see and make people happy and then the video phone really took off, Sorensen video communications and all of that. And so at that time, my father was still living and he was using a TTY. Do you guys remember the TTY he put on his glasses? He had never used a computer in his life. And he would sit there and try to chicken peck the letters, looking at each one, hitting it with their, his pointer fingers. It was so slow to communicate with him. And so then, the communication just was not successful. People would hang up on him, he would get frustrated, and he would depend on me to really help for that communication. And then we got the video phone and I installed it in his house, got in the remote, and I was like, look, this is yours. You can make a phone call, you just have to press this button. And it changed his life. He was able to communicate and chat and he was so inspired. And from that moment on, that's what inspired me. So that was what? Mm, that was a long time ago. I worked for Sorensen. Yeah, so like 16 or 17 years. And then I decided to come up here to Alaska and had, I was a DVR client. So I was part of coming here, which helped me get this job and was able to ask questions and talk with Dwayne, who you recently met when he was speaking. And it 
was a good fit. What can you do for us? Are you a research analyst, IT, computers? And we're like, perfect. So I applied for the position here. And Angela speaking, we're so happy you did. <laughs> All right. And Jeremy, please, uh, how did you get into your field of employment and what inspired you? Sure, this is Jeremy. So when I was a student at RIT, one of the presenters that came to our class was talking about the CIA and doing different types of recruitment. And that presentation was really interesting and kind of opened up my opportunities to what the federal government really offered. And it seemed like it could be a job that I would really fall in love with. So I kind of kept that in the back of my mind. And then once I had graduated from RIT and getting access to the federal government, I had no idea what to do. So I started applying for different jobs in Washington, DC. And different graphic design positions that kind of helped open up different opportunities for me. And I had that job for about a year. And after finishing graduating college, I got a two internship. That was kind of a requirement of my graduation. So there were some challenges due to being deaf and having my resume and trying to get that sent out. And so I had an internship at IBM. IBM. And when I was working for the graphic design company, I was still looking for other opportunities. And I was able to find a job in Washington, DC for the government. And the was Government working, Accountability Office is where I used to work. At the GAO. And I was working with different designs and different th processes, getting them established. And then the Department of Homeland Security and Defense, they had different opportunities under like the umbrella that they had to offer. And one of them was CISA, which is Cybersecurity and Information Structure Agency. And so that was set up and I was able to kind of keep doing my graphic design. And my, was looking for a job that was closer and closer to the area. The DC area. And so my boss wanted to start uh, expanding to different areas in the United States, in eight cities all over the United States. So there was San Francisco and I raised my hand. I said, I would, uh, it, my work schedule would be totally different. But we went ahead and I moved there. I work as an admin, uh, working with um, starting a whole new office in San Francisco. Uh, moved there closer to my wife uh, in different fields, logistics, uh, management, how uh, to, to run an office in a federal agency. Um, and just kept on working uh, when COVID hit. And then at the same time, I got a new job in Washington, DC. So I moved back to DC and that became permanent where I am now. But my new job is senior executive. Um, it's a very high level uh, leadership position. I work closely with DHS, Department of Homeland Security and that whole organizational umbrella um, I do collect some of the 
of President Biden's uh, letters and check those out to make sure that they're um, legal and making sure that um, everything is safe and secure. Uh, you know, we are involved with uh, checking in on the Russian war with Ukraine. So that's where I am. And I've been doing that for a while. I really enjoy it. Daniel, question for you, Jeremy. You had mentioned previously about going to a presentation and you had a large audience. Can you expand more about what that presentation was? Sure. Since the CISA work, um, <clears throat> that was uh, back in the day, but I focused mainly, mainly on training, um, active shooter training workshops, um, also focusing on religious fanatic uh, training, large groups, uh, schools, safety, security. But within uh, a focus of disability, I don't train uh, for that. That's not my, you know, I stand up uh, for rights and I do recognize that that needs to be a focus. But disabilities in America are, are so wide and general. Um, you know, in case of emergency, uh, people need to protect themselves. Nowadays, that's where I become with the CIA disability chairperson. Uh, we review policies and issues related to that to make sure that they meet America's requirements. Daniel said like you're freezing a little bit. Can you go back for me, please? So I'm the chairperson for the disability work group in my agency, where we review different things that we address, such as you know what disabled people need uh, related to an active shooter workshop, um, maybe in a, a school, uh, a, a rehab center, or training to prepare if that happens in their building. So as it so happened, I volunteered to go to the NAD conference that was in Florida recently in July. And I provided a presentation related to how to provide resources on active shooter drills. And I pr presented about that. Uh, I had a slide uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, what to expect during emer an emergency. And I provided an in-person training. It was a two hour training. Uh, we, we got feedback related to that. But um, the next time we'll be in Hawaii uh, next year to have that presentation. They're gonna have the conference there and I'll be doing the same presentation. <laughs> Jeremy, this is Daniel, take me, take me, take me. <laughs> I volunteer. I volunteer. I'll go to Hawaii with you. That's fine. No problem. <laughs> this is Angela speaking. And Jeremy, thank you for sharing that story. I got to say, I don't know that I immediately as a voc rehab counselor would have made the connection from going from graphic design to um, senior executive double checking letters for the president at the White House. That's quite a career ladder that you progressed. And I am so happy that you shared that story because as a voc rehab counselor, I can now use that as an example of, of a possible career ladder. So thank you. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel for question number three. Yes, this is Daniel. Okay, Noel, what type of training vocational, college, did you use to get you where you are today being successful? This is Noel. Uh, really, the training was at Gallaudet. I, and I was admitted. I looked at different types of art, uh, psychology major. I went to psychology classes. I really fell in love with psychology. Uh, I had to declare a major during my freshman year and went through, well, let me go back a little bit. Um, in high school, I, may, I had um, a magnet school, which meant that we focused on art. She's frozen, go ahead. 
<laughs> so we did different studios that we would have and then my background knowledge and mm -hmm. oh, a lot of training for painting and art and the variety of different things and so that all kind of led me to Gallaudet where I was able to major in psychology and kind of go through that graduated I got it and right. I had my internship and I worked with uh, deaf students, uh, interning with them a different position, World uh, Federation for the Deaf, WFD. I also interned with uh, NAD, all sorts of different uh, places in Canada, um, with and had interactions with all sorts of people. And I really liked doing uh, the psychology and art combination and became an art therapist. So I had to wait to go to graduate school uh, and I took the opportunity to go with um, hearing disabled plus population uh, to do art and they would sell their art. And it was a small organization and I could see how I liked working with them and doing art therapy with them. And that was a great training for me. I really liked it. And that uh, I got a lot of internship opportunities because of that. At that time, I didn't have a specific art therapy mentor. Uh, there were no mentors at that time for a deaf art therapist. So I want to explore and expand the art therapy world for the deaf. Uh, it's been, you know, all this time recognizing um, not having any art therapist uh, recognition for the deaf and it's a very small community but I had heard and I knew about some art um, therapy programs but and they were very exclusive so I continued my best kind of choosing courses internships uh, going to different classes and that's how I got here by combining all those classes are you, this is Daniel. Are you still learning every day? Is it a continuous process? Yes, this is Noel. Now uh, things are better. I'm uh, have my major now uh, with my PhD program, and things are going well. But I am still looking uh, to find another deaf art therapist. Still on the search. Uh, with, you know, I haven't, because I need somebody with a specific license so I can be supervised by them. And, Ryan, please take over again. And there's Sorry. only three, three counselors that have that certification and licensing. in art therapy specifically. And, but for general therapy and counseling for deaf and hard of hearing, there is a wider variety, but there is still not enough. Um, there's not enough in this group. So, I mean, we're always looking for getting more deaf people who are able to kind of find what their niche is and find what is curious to them to where they are able to get that fit and make what fits best for them. This is Angela and I'm curious, you were talking about your internships and being involved with different organizations while you were going to Gallaudet. The extracurricular activity that you were doing, did you notice that that really helped you in getting into your field? This is Noel. Mm, I guess general internship, yes, but not so much like at the organization. I mean, I didn't really find my career. Okay, Angela speaking. I was just curious if the different um, extracurriculars you're doing through Gallaudet helped with any networking, but. Um, you were getting plenty of networking opportunity through your internship, so that's great. But thank you for sharing. That's yes, we do need more therapists in general that uh, specializing in working with the deaf and hard of hearing. But yours is even more specific, Anisha, and that's incredible. Thank you so much. This is Noel. Thank you. Okay, 
This is Daniel. So I have the same question and to answer. So I got into California State University Northridge and I couldn't make a decision on what major. So my freshman and sophomore year it was not required that I pick a specific major. So I was able to pick my classes as I wanted, what interests me. And then I really started thinking about what I wanted to major in. And I was like, I have no idea. English, I do love English. I do love history. I do love psychology. I mean, I love a variety of topics. And then the internet became popular. And I was like, oh, and I really fell in love with that. And I want to major in that. And how does this connect together? And they're like, no, we don't have anything like that. I was like, how do you not have this program that I want? So I really kept learning anyways, and really tried to find a way for it to connect back. And so it was a little bit off point, but going into CSUN, years 91 to 95, around the year of 1994, they had an earthquake which had a big uh, impact on interpreters. You know, lots of them moved out of the state. Uh, there weren't plenty enough for schools. Um, my school, we didn't have any interpreter. We had, um, you know, we had maybe eight or nine interpreters for about 250 students. You know, at that time I was a senior. So there wasn't any interpreters for a year. I had to suffer through it. I went to my classes. I didn't understand what was going on. Um, and I decided, you know, enough is enough. I decided to drop out of school. I was done. And that was a little bit of a disappointment. And CSUN didn't offer the internship experience at my time there. And I didn't even know that was an option until I started figuring out and finding out later the opportunities and experiences to learn. So getting those as a requirement, so you're able to develop those skills, I didn't know that. So I just was self-taught at that point, going through hands-on experiences, kind of going through trying to fix things as they came and read information and write information and communicate with other people to really get to the computer trade. I mean, electrical, everything was such a so expiring and exciting trying to figure out how everything worked together and once I was able to kind of learn that oh yes CSUN I did have a vocational rehab experience there VR there helped me get successful and provided me the tools I needed in school they helped provide uh, the computer that I needed and later I was able to come to vocational rehab again, and I was able to have different evaluations done, and I was able to find what kind of certifications or if I needed to go back to school, so I was able to learn those skills going back to work. But most of it came from reading and writing. I mean, I'm one deaf person in a hearing world and trying to figure out how to communicate because a lot of stuff just kind of gets missed. And finding people who are able to sign, I mean, most people don't sign. So learning how to communicate, writing back and forth, using technology, having chat features in different ways and using the computer. Impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I'm going to pass Lane. What kind of training or what did you get to become successful to where you are today? Well, uh, a lot more people are overqualified than me, I'll say that to start off. Um, I, I think my, like I explained earlier, I think mine's a lot of trial by fire, like, like you mentioned. Um, uh, but doing shows and things like that in particular, anybody who gets in show business, once you start throwing shows, you realize how much money things start taking to do certain things, like doing even concerts for like the deaf community, it still costs a lot of money, just from the venue to the sound and all that stuff. And on top of that, you're adding the accessibility element. And so that is where I think the trial by fire is me putting up all the money going, I don't care how much money it takes. I want to figure out the solution, you know, because then once you start playing on the level of what everyone else does for shows, then they realize, okay, so this guy's serious about shows. 
so they understand what it, what all this means. So then we can collaborate with them because they understand that it's not as simple as, okay, we could have an interpreter the entire show. Like we have to understand, he has to understand, you have to understand logistics and how shows work and why certain things can work for shows and when they cannot. And same with things with movie theaters. You just, it's not as simple as accessibility. We say what the problem is and it's solved because sometimes it's not even the movie theater's fault. It's other people and other entities. Um, and so that's where I got a lot of my training, a lot of my mentoring is I went to these companies and I said, make it make sense to me because for me, I'm a consumer. I want to have the best experiences in life. I want my friends who are hard of hearing and deaf to have the best experiences. So why is the hospital not accessible? Why is this not accessible? Why are these things that are all an everyday thing that we complain about not solved? And, and I took it and, and consumed as much information as possible. Uh, and then that's also why I got to invest in a lot of shows. So I, I I mean, there's one show where I spent over like $100,000 $100, collectively with other people to throw one show. Um, and it's, it's a very privileged point of view, but it's also very risky. And so you have to understand what you're doing in the industry. So it's not something you can really just go to school for and then you know how to do it. You actually have to be able to risk. It's just like a business. You have to risk all of it to understand what you are really getting yourself into. Um, and so it's, uh, I would say I'm very lucky. Um, I'm very uh, humble. I try to be as humble about it as possible. And that's why I try and uh, use that opportunity to bring as much accessibility into the music space because I'm able to talk to those people who spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and are willing to have that conversation because I did it and learned and did what they think is accessible. Uh, acceptable in the industry so it's it's not something you can go to school for necessarily it's something you have to be willing to risk all of it and if you risk all of it then you learn everything of why they make it near impossible to do accessibility and then you can have those conversations of hey why can't you have an induction loop here or why can't you have an interpreter and they go oh hey McLean, well we can you just have to do it a certain way and then so that's why now i partner with festivals and use my mentoring and what I've learned and, and from all the other companies. And that's why companies reach out to me because they don't understand why can't our technology work? So I'm kind of the middleman between the hearing world and the deaf community for a lot of these companies because they don't have that connection. They don't know how, they can't put two and two together, I guess. So that's a little bit. I mean, if you have other specific questions, that's, but that's, that's, that's a lot of where my training comes from. So yeah. Wow, that is great. This is Daniel. So now we're going to pass it over to Jason. What are your experiences? What have training have you had? What have you learned along the way? When I was in high school, uh, my mind wasn't uh, set for what I wanted to do. I wanted to keep my mind open, see my, what my opportunities, what was out there. I played football in high school. Uh, for about a year and I, I hated it. Uh, I played this other sport, hated art. Sorry, Noel. <laughs> so I, I kept my mind open to different things. I tried things, checked off boxes. And then I thought about working in an office related to technology. And I liked it. I really liked it. I worked working in an office for three years. And then I decided to eh, go for something else to be a client advocate. Um, and I liked doing that with people. And that's where I like working with people. And then with Sorensen, working with technology, working with people, great combination. I've been doing that since. Uh, just keep your mind open, try different things. And then, you know, you, you can't have your mindset on just one thing. Uh, I was in Job Corps. Uh, it's a training program in Sacramento. Uh, I did that for about a year. I got my certificate there and I went through more training with different types of uh, with customer service in Sorensen. I went to Utah headquarters, trained there more in depth, hands-on training. Uh, the hands-on training is good for me. I liked it. And 
uh, still to this day, I feel like I'm learning things every day with related to technology. Everything's new and I just keep on training. Uh, I just, like I say, go with the flow. I'm really happy doing that. This is Daniel. Yes, thank you. Um, and Jeremy, you are our last one. I was mainstreamed growing up. So my socialization with deaf was so, so more deaf adults. And when I was mainstreamed, we did have junior NAD. And that is where I learned a lot of my leadership skills and really became a leader in high school. So I was very involved with that leadership, different types of trainings. And my last three years of high school, I really took up a lot of leadership classes and trying to find that leadership skill to really develop where I am today. And so I have been able to learn a lot. There wasn't a huge culture shock for me, but really having to work and focus on the communication and getting through being involved. An Asian deaf club. Um, I was uh, working with that club and I socialized a lot with uh, Asian deaf people and I led them around and taught them about American culture. Uh, I graduated from RIT. I did some jobs. Um, then people, friends, uh, I had a leadership um, work role in the NAD uh, for NTID as well. Now I was chairperson. Now I'm chairperson for NAD ambassador. Uh, I have a role and we have different regions that we're part of. Uh, we have different events. We have gatherings, especially during COVID. We started to, after COVID, we, you know, we still got together on the internet. It took some, lead, I took some leadership training related to the government. And so I could use those skills um, the, in the Office of Personnel Management. Uh, and that's a, a large or a very high level federal job. <clears throat> I just recently volunteered for one school, Harvard. And so I decided to apply there. I thought, you never know. Then recently in April, I was a lot, uh, chosen to go into to take classes at Harvard and it's for a higher level leadership training program. So I went to Boston just recently in May to June. Uh, it was a one semester, a compressed semester of four weeks and studied, oh, my eyes, I had lots of books to read, but now I understand what it's like to be a Harvard student. It's uh, quite amazing. But I did presentations, it was great. The lecturers were great. Uh, you know, I can do that in the White House. I was with uh, President Carter in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and I was part of that leadership program, and I learned a lot at that time. And that's brought me to what I am working with today as a supervisor. Uh, I have several people under me now, and I learned a lot. Um, I, You know, I can tell you never stop learning, you know, with when, even if you have a job that learning doesn't stop. I've taken classes at Harvard and that's how I uh, progress in my job. You never know what's gonna happen. You never stop learning. This is Daniel here again. I completely agree with you. Oh, sounds so fun. And just being able to like go to school and just continue to learn the more and more and get certifications, get different trainings, different opportunities start to appear. And if you have that mindset, oh, I'm done learning. Nope, you got to keep that all the way through. And it seems like we all have a very similar message. That's very cool. Evangeline, thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, our next question. Ooh, I like this one. This is one of my favorite ones. Uh, 
who were your role models when you were growing up and why? So Noel, please share with us who your role model was and why they were your role model. This is Noel speaking. I have a few role models um, in my different life um, chapters. No one role model. Like you mentioned, we learn every day, uh, life changes, you know, we have different needs, but number one were my parents, my deaf family, my parents, they all encouraged me to be, to self-advocate, to get communication access. So my parents uh, were great role models for me. My parents and my grandparents, my grandfather specifically, uh, worked in federal court and they were, you know, where I became an American citizen at one year old, they believed in me, no matter what they said, I could do anything, keep going, keep going. They always told me as I, as I grew, and I felt that there, I felt like their support keeps me going to do what I want to do. Uh, the next chapter, another role model, a local, Dr. Glenn Anderson, Glenn Anderson, you may know him. A great man. My, he was the first Black <clears throat> American to get a degree. Uh, he, he's a deaf man. He checked on me. He made sure I had connections with the deaf community. He would always say, what are you doing in school? And I would tell him and uh, he would always ask me how I was doing. And he also would give me fist bumps or high fives to keep going. Still to this day, I see him and you know he always gives me a fist bump. He says, how are you doing? Keep going, keep going. That always gave me, he always has my back. Um, I have a few instructors um, in Arkansas Deaf School. There's, they also uh, encourage me to keep going. Plus, um, another art uh, inst instructor here, they would see my art and they would see that I'm capable and I would send them, they would send my art to competitions and like the Lions Club and I would win. Uh, and I, they saw that I was capable and I could do all sorts of things. I went to a hearing school, as I mentioned earlier. Um, one teacher named Amanda Lynn she would always encourage me and to, still to this day, I talk with her and she's very encouraging and supportive and a very big mentor role model in my life is Dr. Caroline Kobeck Pizarossi. She's a psychology faculty at Gallaudet. As it happens, we're from the same state. We grew up in the same state. I know her mother. Uh, I never thought that Carrie would be my role model or mentor, but she was, she really was my um, psychology dean. And I see her as my academic advisor. And they said, no, you can't because you're from the same state. You have to have that boundary. And the deaf community is so small. And I said, no, I really want her. They said, go ahead and try and meet her. And so I went, I met with her. And I told her, you know, we're from the state, same state, but we have a, a boundary. Oh, but once you meet her, you like her already. And we interacted at Gallaudet. You know, she is a very disciplined uh, instructor. And that's good for me. That's really good with me. She encourages me. She pushes me to go forward, to think out of the box, to do things that are out of my comfort zone. She goes, why don't you be an art therapist? And I had never heard that before. So she was the one that introduced me. That was the spark that triggered everything. I think I think of her as my mentor still. Um, she even after I graduated, she would check on me in graduate school, and she said, "Keep going, keep going, keep going." And still to this day, and I'm in my program, and she contacts me just to make sure I'm doing well. She's a good friend as well. I really love her. Um, but I have many people in my life who are role models. I have clients and students. I have a, a role model that really inspires me and encourages me to keep going, you know, and the community, the community in itself. This is Daniel. I agree. Passing it now to my turn. I have a very similar answer. 
role model is impossible to pick just one person. There's so many different facets of people that you meet that inspire you. In addition to positive people like here at work, maybe people that you meet that are in a wheelchair or different people who have different life experiences who are always smiling. And I'm just like, oh, gives me goosebumps. Like you don't have the ability to do certain things, but the clients, anybody can do anything. So definitely want to start with my parents, similar to yours. My father, such a hard worker, making all money to provide for our family, having a shelter, providing food, and such a good provider. And then my mother, she was our motivation to keep doing our work. Stop playing, get to work. I mean, she was very strict. It was eat, study, sleep, rest, but making sure that we were healthy and able to function at school. That was a big priority a lot of discipline there. So my parents, definitely. And then I had one professor, an English teacher, Bar Bar Barbara Boyd. Barbara Boyd. <laughs> that individual was deaf. And it just seemed odd that a deaf student had kind of been behind him and was like, we're the same, we can communicate. And he just encouraged us to continue to read so many books, or in her class, excuse me, 10, 15 books. And there would be so many deaf people and then more people would start to join. And deaf people would be like, why am I joining an English class? And I would just say, you have to keep reading, you have to keep that's how you become successful as a deaf person. You have to have that communication skill and understand how to do it. And so that is really where I started to ask my questions. Would you prefer reading or watching a movie? And some people would raise their hand movie and some people say reading and that's fine. But if you watch uh, Rain Man, And then you go and read the book and then you ask that again, which is your favorite? And people would be like, oh, I like the movie. I like the book. I mean, both. How do you pick? See, it's interesting. You get a different experience and different perspective from each approach. And then, oh, let me look at my notes. Troy Kotzer, he was in the Coda movie. We went to see some together. He's a good friend. And being, we worked together at GLAD in Los Angeles. And so we had fun watching him really grow into the person that he's become today as an actor. But I mean, I remember when he was young and then now he's getting a big award for being a star and oh, it gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. And I've known him 25, 30 years now. I mean, yeah. That's a long time and he's worked at it and continued to work at it. And now he was just getting that award. So, and I'm not sure, do any of you guys watch TikTok? Have you guys seen that one black gentleman, Cammy Lane? He has become very famous because of his facial expressions. He doesn't speak a word, he just points to things. But why is he famous? Hold on, I have an article. Look at, he has an article. Um, I will put the link to this in the chat. And he is earning so much money before he was making $1,000 a month working in a warehouse. And then COVID hit and he lost his job. They laid everybody off. And he really was trying to figure out how can I make some money? And so he started making these videos and he was having fun and he was enjoying it and having a good time while he was making these videos. And they have really become so popular. And now when he makes one video, he gets $750,000 for one video. I mean, two years ago, he was making next to nothing and now he's making all of this money. So I just really love the simplicity and I do absolutely agree. It doesn't need to be complicated. Like for example, peeling the banana. I mean, 
are you going to sit there and like shave each of it? No, you're going to peel each part of the banana back. So just the simplicity of that. And my last one would be Stuart Jobs. You guys know uh, Steve Jobs for that created Apple. He's such a creative individual, high quality, really making sure that it was passed down to the people. So I say that because, you know, when texting first started in about 1992 and it has progressed, he was providing messages in about 2008, 2010, I can't remember exactly, but um, if you had different per phone providers, they would cost money to send one text message. And so if you didn't have that text plan included, you would be charged. And so then Apple came up with the idea of the iMessage. So that created a way for free communication to take crap to take place. And then you were able to send videos or photographs and not have separate charges. So there's different variety of people who have been an inspiration for me. This is Angela and thank you, Daniel. You've had two questions now that between talking about the invention of the iMessage and the charging for text messages. And I think you even mentioned Netscape earlier. You're making me feel old, sir, because I remember when all of these things <laughs> came out and it's hurting my soul a little bit, uh, but that's fine, totally fine. <laughs> so we will pass it on. Uh, McLean, who was your role model growing up and why? Kenny Tatum. Emma Watson, Leonardo DiCaprio. I mean, come on. We are all missing the classic actors <laughs> that we all look up to. Justin Bieber, everyone loves him. Elon Musk. Uh, no, those are obviously anecdotal and uh, they're all great for their own reason. Um, obviously, a lot of the person I am is to my mother and my father. Um, though they're not together, they, they separated when I was very young. They had a very good co-parenting relationship to allow me and my brother to have the best experiences growing up. Um, I think that's a lot of why I've been so adamant in my field and don't, don't care as much about, when you meet other people at your shows, you realize how much money influences their choices or what they do and things like that, which is all great, you know, money's great. Uh, but a lot of my family, you already had money, uh, my father was a physician assistant, and then he has a lot of relatives who built themselves to the millionaires or even billionaires. And being around people like that who built it for themselves and really just cared about what they did and care about the money, they just live life as I really love this. I know everything about it, and that's all I care about in life. Um, it made me want to be like that too. I just couldn't find out what that was until I started doing shows. So my father loving medical field. He went to the, he went, served in the Vietnam war uh, and I could never serve in military. So that's why now I work with the VA because I really wanted to join the military. It's just, they wouldn't allow me to join because I relied on a hearing device. Uh, so that's why I try and help out people who are in service because I have a lot of respect for people who, who did that for our country. Uh, my mom's, a, I just retired as a math teacher of 30 years of high school. And, uh, it made me respect teachers. And that's why I work a lot with schools as well is because I understand how much they go through and how much they are so undervalued in our communities and how much even parents don't realize how valuable these people can be. Um, and so growing up, having respect for the teachers, whether kids thought they were very rude because they're very strict or if they're very fun as teachers, you realize where they're coming from because teaching 250 kids you know, every school year and, and having to care about each and every one of them and dealing with everything they do, you just realize that's a lot to ask of someone. And so when I do shows, I, that's why I care about the experience and what every single person there gets. It's not about the hard of hearing community and giving everything they, could, they would want because I'm hard of hearing. I also realize that the deaf need just as much attention as the hard of hearing as deaf and blind or any other disability that may come to shows um, or people who need my help. I, I, don't, I don't try and limit myself to one thing. And so that's probably the biggest role models in my life is definitely my parents. 
because they have taught me a lot about um, you just have to care about what you care about. Don't care as much about the money because if you care about the money, you're, it's just going to turn you into something you don't want to be. And, uh, and, and it's very prevalent. I think a lot of people are seeing that with companies who care more about the money than our community. And uh, I don't want to be that. So I will give my, that would be the only two people I mentioned. There's obviously many other people I could do, but no one will ever triumph my parents and the family that I grew up with and made me into the person I am today. Angela speaking, and thank you, McLean. That was wonderful. Uh, Jason, same question to you. Who was your role model growing up and why? Yes, I'm Jason speaking. Actually, I don't have a specific role model. Um, I follow uh, different people. I have, like Noel was saying, I've had different people in my life at different chapters. My mom always said, you can do it. That, you know, just ride the train, you know, go and, and she, there is a storybook uh, about a hill and the train that would go up and the hill and my mom would say to me you can do it you can do it you can do it and that's something that I found uh if there was a challenge I would ask my mom about that I want to do that and my mom would always end the, with that story saying you can do it you can do it and I followed that all my life and that's how I stayed and where I am today because of my mom um I was in a movie before a very short part uh, Robin with Robin Williams. Uh, I think I was 11 years old. I don't remember that age. I, I think I was 11. It, I was in a movie with him and I watched Robin and I, he loved people and I was the same way. And I really wasn't sure what my path would be until much later. And I remember Robin loving people in his career. And so I looked up to him uh, as well as my mom. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture. <laughs> Thomas the train, the little train that could. I always think of my mom when I see that train. Uh, and that's how I have a happy life. This is Daniel speaking. Did you read stories about Robin Williams? Or that was kind of my question to you. Is every movie that he kind of found out or looked for people to join with him and brought them to the movies or he would hire them. Is that true? Is that accurate representation? Yes, that's true. Um, he went to my hometown in Taft, California. It's near uh, Bakersfield. And uh, he, I was playing a college football game and the movie Best of the Time, Best of Those Times, I was in that movie, Best of Times, uh, a very small part, very small role. And Robin saw me talking to my dad. Um, and he said, uh, he came up to me, says, you want to be in a movie with, uh, with a really small part? And I said, sure. And, uh, you know, I was involved with that movie from beginning to end with um, Ethan Hawke, uh, Russell um different different uh people in that in that movie it was really great experience and uh if you ask me to be in a movie now i said nope 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 i've checked off that bucket list one time is good enough i don't think i would do it again <laughs> very good experience this is angela and i feel like we had a missed opportunity for you to put down that you were a movie star in your bio that you sent to us so that we could send it out where was that? <laughs> it keeps me humble. I stay humble. <laughs> well, thank you, Jason, for sharing. That was not where I expected that answer to go, but I'm so happy it went there because that's a fabulous story. And Jeremy, last but not least for this question, who was your role model growing up and why? Sure. This is Jeremy. Listening to your guys' stories and your comments about who you guys looked up to really got me thinking. And I couldn't think of one person 
there's a variety. There's several people. My parents, of course, they were the ones that raised me to be a quote unquote good boy. And I am a good boy. The director of nursing, uh, really being able to see them kind of work up the ladder and continue to become successful was a really great example growing up. And that was my mom. And then my dad was an engineer and he had the stamp approval to kind of create hospital beds and how they are able to move with a remote. So he was the engineer on that and how the walkers are able to kind of uh, collapse in and out the patent for that. So those were very successful areas that he was able to create and make tools that were accessible. My sister-in-law, she works focusing on the ADA and she looks at me as a deaf individual We're having some freezing. So we're gonna take it back a second. So yeah, so my sister works as a lawyer. In the Supreme Court with disability rights. And so she sees me as a deaf individual working to be successful. And my brother, he builds houses from start to finish and being able to watch that whole process and see that vision come to production is really inspiring. One person I have never met, but do look up to that I see on LinkedIn. Jenny Lay Flory. Yes, Jenny Lay Flory, yes. Deaf individual, director of accessibilities. Working for Microsoft, <laughs> giving different presentations, um, you know, providing the option that we can do it, um, providing different ex uh, examples with technology during Microsoft, you know, starting the conversation through, you know, it, it, during COVID, for example, creating more accessibility to be able to communicate. Um, with the disabled uh, population, you know, uh, becoming chief from that role at Microsoft, and and she is one person that I that I do really look up to. And also another person, a uh, college that I met was John Panra. He has set up uh, the performing arts at RIT, an English professor. Professor and nothing would stop him for being able to really keep going and having that structure of English to live his life and to make sure he was able to read and communicate successfully. And that's really the key to success. And of course my wife too, I look up to her. She's always encouraging me to keep going and she is really always encouraging me to keep growing as well. And this is Daniel. <laughs> I, miss, I missed it. <laughs> Daniel, said, Daniel I asked if she yeah, he, he asked watch. if. <laughs> Daniel, this is Jeremy. Is your wife standing right there watching you say that? <laughs> is she your role model? Is she watching you say that in front of everybody? But. Um, I do know Jeremy, um, we have met several times and oh, yes, he is such a humble individual. I had no idea about your history between your father or your parents. You never really brag about any of that. So hats off to you and so much respect. Thank you. <laughs> this is Angela. Um, and one of the things I noticed for all of you talking is uh, a couple people uh, name dropped celebrities, movie stars, stuff like that. But uh, every single one of you had role models that were just everyday people in your lives. Um, people that um, 
possibly didn't even know that they had an impact. Um, and that's the best thing is that I think a lot of people, a lot of youth especially, are looking for role models and they're seeing people on TikTok or um, movie stars and stuff like that. And they're looking to that to be the role model. But really the people that helped encourage you throughout your entire life were um, school counselors, were your parents, were friends that you had in college, um, spouses. You made my heart melt a little bit on that one, Jeremy. Um, but it's it, it was the everyday people in your life that really helped encourage you um, to become the successful people that you are today. And that's beautiful stories to hear. Um, so thank you guys for sharing that. Uh, we're gonna turn it over to Daniel for question number five. This is Danielle. Okay, Noel. So children who are growing up and wanting to set their goals and motivation, what kind of advice do you have for them to keep them motivated? Um, as Jason mentioned, keep your mind open. Keep an open mind. Keep your heart open. Be curious, as he mentioned. You know, having a curiosity, a wonder. And, and then that spark will happen and then that motivation will start that drive to to uh, catch catch with people ask questions uh, don't be passive you know if you have a wondering about something go ahead and ask as many questions as you want to find out your true abilities network uh, get out there uh, go through uh, through social media or friends or tools that you can put in your toolbox. Take every opportunity, take every opportunity you can say yes. Uh, at the same time, go to workshops, take opportunities to learn, go to different, um, different events and put all that in your tool belt, your toolbox, all those skills will benefit you and that way you will be ready. Don't be afraid, you know, just keep going, uh, do your, Go be, to the beat of your own drum. Uh, get involved with things. Your life is your own. No one else can tell you uh, what to do or limit you. This is Daniel. Oh, yes, go ahead. Oh, I just remembered something. I, went, I want to go back and add one more thing. Uh, the question prior, I forgot to explain why my father, uh, he's a deaf chemist. And there were only a few chemists back in the day anyway. So him being deaf and having me, I'm the few, a few in my field too, as an art therapist. So I wanted to add that as well. Daniel's turn, and he's holding up a sign that says question everything with Albert Einstein, and then a saying that says I'm neither clever nor especially gifted. And reading stories on Facebook, true or not true, I'm not sure, but being able to show that Albert Einstein writing on a chalkboard, a blackboard, and showing that fm equals like this whole big long math equation down to equal 91. Is that true? I mean, I'm not sure. It depends on the audience. It depends if the audience is laughing or finding that that's a mistake or really what they are, what's their point. And then the teacher said, I did this whole math problem correct and nobody said anything, nobody applauded me, but I make one mistake and you guys are so quick to criticize. Going back to Cami Lane, he has a quote saying, people have the influence to easily make you change your mind and criticize you. So they stop you from chasing your dreams because somebody told you that you can't. Tr 
trying to keep it positive. So we're sending the good vibes out and so showing people that they are able to do it. I feel myself as a deaf individual, I may be limited in language or limited because of my hearing or I'm not able to do something, but that curiosity, that curiosity is what makes me able and what gives me more confidence to really move forward and really continue to grow and develop the skills in the areas in which I enjoy them and really learning the importance of curiosity. Very similar to what Noel said, involved in different camps and leadership camps and all of the different things that we all find passion in, be it an internship or coming together in different events, having social socializing and supporting each other, not letting people, if they start to bring you down, quit that and move on to something that really gets you as a person and understands you who you are. Go ahead, Noel. I wanted to add to that comment. Often people think work is life um, but if you don't do work you know you're not going to you have to have a whole spectrum vocational academic you know as long as you have skills and use those skills uh, and that will be more of making a happy life if you're interested in a high level job or a simple job that's fine as long as you're happy doing your job it won't feel like work this is Daniel, yes. Moving on now to McLean. I mean, yeah, I think the best, uh, best advice for people who want to, what, you can't let people obviously tell you what you can and can't be in life. I think growing up in the mainstream society, once I told people about like my hearing loss, people were quick to tell me what I can and can't do which definitely growing up, it definitely hindered what I thought of myself. It, it put more weight on my disability and what I thought of myself or what my parents told me. And it's very true what people, your, what you say can really influence people's decisions, um, which is why I'm very passionate about like the music spaces because so many people look at me like I'm crazy when I say I want to do concerts for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, and they're like, that's impossible. And I'm like, well, if you're going to say it's impossible, then I'm, I, I'm going to prove you wrong. And then you're going to have to apologize for saying things are impossible because we live in a society where we have so much technology, we have so many things. Um, so I think it's important to find what you're really passionate about and find a way that you can make money out of it. It doesn't matter where you're at in life. You just have to make sure that you really want to go into that and anybody who wants to tell you can't do it, you have to cut those people out of your life and surround yourself with people who don't allow people like that in their life. Because the people I allow in my circle are people who have big, big dreams and work every day to achieve them. And even if they aren't where they want to be in life, the key is, is everyone's working towards that goal and they're happy. And they're not telling other people what they can and can't do. They're just trying to find ways to help each other get to that next step. Um, because in, in the, if you surround yourself with people that really hate life and don't want to look at the optimism side of life, then, then you're really not going to get far in whatever you choose to do in life. Um, and, and I think that's one of the best pieces of advice uh, that I've ever been given is just find something that you love and just find a way to make money out of it and you won't work a day in your life. And, no, I get to do a lot of crazy things. I get to hang out with a lot of artists and do many crazy things. I think a lot of people are like, wow, his life must be great. It's not about money. It's not about fame or being around famous people. It's just I get to talk to people who are like-minded, who are love, love what they do. And they they want more for themselves. I want more for myself. And, and we're just happy to be able to do that um, and be surrounded by people who do that as well. So, um I will say one of the best best stories that I've ever had was uh, somebody told me that they're like, hey, we can't do accessibility at the show. I was like, okay. And so what I did is I went to one of the other owners of the festival and I said, hey, I'll give you $15,000, but I can do whatever I want the show. He's like, okay, yeah, you'll invest in the show. And so all I did for the show was make it accessible. And 
during the show, that guy comes up to me. He's like, I didn't know you're going to be at the show. I'm like, yeah, I'm the one. I'm one of your investors, and uh, and it's accessible. The thing that you said we couldn't do, and so we had a very good conversation. And at the end of the day, I just saw him. It's like the way that you approach people and tell them what they can and can't do in life can really hinder. People can take that in a negative way. So it's your responsibility to be careful with your words and encourage people to always push forward and figure out a solution rather than say there's no solution and work backwards because saying no doesn't push the envelope any further no one wins at the end of the day and uh and it doesn't do anything to help our society so i like doing those kind of things so i think that's the best piece of advice find something you love to do and find a way to make money doing it you never have to work a day in your life so Angela speaking, and thank you, McLean. Now on to Jason. What sort of information would you like to give to our youth uh, to really get them working and develop? This is Jason speaking. Um, I'm on the same as Noel. Keep your mind open. Keep uh, what you opportunities you want to look into. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's okay. Learn from your mistakes. Um, you know, you improve for, from your mistakes and learn and get better. Have a good heart. Have an open heart. Focus on um, taking the mistakes you made and make them positive. Change them to a more productive way of living. Uh, make yourself, make sure that you're happy with yourself too. Like Noel said, you know, you have the one to make the decision. We can't make the decisions for you. Take people's advice, uh, think about it, but make the decision for yourself. You are in control of your own life. Even if you're married, doesn't matter. <laughs> you still control your own life. This is Angela and real quick, I just wanted to uh piggyback on something Jason said about not being afraid to make mistakes. And so real quick, I want to do a show of hands with the panelists. How many of you had made mistakes in your career and learned something from it? Show of hands. McLean never have made a mistake. Okay, there we go. That's better. <laughs> so yes, um, for the youth that haven't heard that message yes, yet, yes, we are all going to make mistakes and we are all going to learn from them and it's going to be okay on the other side. So this is Daniel. Nobody's perfect. Jason, did you want to add anything else? Nope, I'm good. I'm good. All right, over to Jeremy. What advice do you have to share with our youth? With IT, there is always going to be a failure. That's how IT is created, and that is how we learn to do better next time. If it was perfect, then there might be a failure at the end or something that could happen worse later. You know, if you have a lake and you throw a rock into it, it will send out ripples. And that is how you start to get better. I have a lot of graphic design pictures to kind of get that I can send through social media. Having a ladder, two different ladders, one set up with the rungs kind of set smaller steps moving forward and then one with giant steps moving forward up the ladder and you having to take larger leaps is harder to pull yourself and really pull yourself all the way up versus taking the smaller steps you move faster you're able to have more success just kind of like um a Nike slogan? Just do it. If there's no risk, there's no reward. And you want to avoid the people who are toxic because that will impact you and how you produce. And for me personally, trying not to do a ton of social media, 
and really take that time to help grow you as an individual. Body, mind, all of it is included to making yourself better. And stay motivated, reading, writing, practice learning English, perfecting your English, and continuing to apply for opportunities and work in the future with your friends or just really opening up your opportunities. One thing that I look to that I read over and over again, the Mano Theory. I believe it's the Mayo jar theory. Or the so mayo. for example, you have a whole bunch of golf balls and you place them in this in this jar. You know, and that's big aspects in your life, important things that happen. You know, uh, is that jar really full? No, you can still add more stuff into it. For example, you can add marbles. So it fills up the smaller amounts of space. You know, uh, without with those big journeys, you have smaller circumstances that happen that impact your life. Um, and then if you think that's full, you're wrong. You know, we have we have pebbles, we have sand, we have other things, maybe your favorite activities and smaller life events that happen. Is it full from there? No, you can still go to the next thing. We can go to sand, even smaller aspects and finally fill up the jar. You know, you know, maybe we think we have plenty of space, but the last final thing is water, for example, that fills up the jar. You know, things that complete your life. There are plenty of different things that represent that. Your friends, your family, your work, schooling, a variety of different settings and ways to, um, you know, fill up your life. Reading that always makes me think of, you know, life is short. Take opportunities when you can. This is Daniel. When you were talking about like no social media, are you talking about prioritizing what's important? And Jeremy's saying, yep, that's correct. So making sure you're prioritizing your family and making sure you're having time to play and have fun, that it's all a balance. Noelle? I want to add two things I realized. Often, you know, the encouragement, but you forget to have... Um, people to have um, empathy for themselves or to to be okay to be human you forget you know you're not ro a robot you're human life uh you know it's like a com competition to the deadline uh there's no 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 set deadline for you that you have to get there by age 30 or by certain uh, milestones you have to have a house you have to have a career you are the one to make the ultimate decision. This is Daniel. Wow. All right. This is Angela. We did have a sixth question, and we probably would have gotten to that if I was really, really strict about the three minutes each. But every single one of you had such great stories to tell that I did not want to interrupt any of you at the three minute mark. I wanted to let it keep going because you guys were fantastic. So thank you so much for all of that. We have 10 minutes left, so um, that's not enough time to get through the sixth question, but it is enough time to hopefully cover some questions and answers from our audience. So audience, if you have been patiently waiting with your questions, we appreciate you so very much. At this time, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Oh, I apologize. Um, uh, we did get um, Rick from RIT. We are going to spotlight him real quick. He has a quick story to tell. Um, and we'll let him take over for a couple minutes. Rick, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Very nice surprise bonus for me to show up <laughs> uh, for the, the three day conference. Uh, are you going to have voice interpreters uh, for the, the parents? But I was wanting to tell a story. I'm Rick Postle. I uh, have a deaf family in Chicago. My parents, my brothers, uh, aunts, uncles, uh, nephews, nieces are all deaf. Um, I'm soon going to have a wedding to a, a deaf uh, person. Uh, RIT, I'm the director of uh, admissions. I travel all over this country. Last week, I was in Utah. Uh, this Sunday, I'm going to be going to Idaho and California. Then back home, uh, then 
back to Texas, then I'm going to be going back and forth again to California, then Washington State, Oregon, and that is all before November. So it's going to be uh, frequent flyer miles. Uh, in the last three months, I've been to California three times. Uh, January, I'm going to be going again. I have met so many deaf and hard of hearing people all over, over 600 high schools I've visited. And it's amazing. Working with students, deaf and hard of hearing students are amazing. Uh, I can't stop thinking about them, you know, and uh, many of them don't know what they're going to do. When I was young, with my deaf family, we all signed to each other. There were some hearing family members too. But when I went to high school, uh, and it was the first time to be in a mainstream school, I was the only deaf person, and I was afraid. I thought hearing people were more superior. But I thought, why? Nobody said that to me. Nobody said that that hearing people were superior was a, an inner implicit bias. I went to a deaf and hard of hearing school with, uh, in Wisconsin. I had interpreters. I sat with many students who were the same and I didn't want people to look at me, but we need to stop that. We are just the same as everyone. We limit ourselves and we oppress ourselves. We can just do anything we want, anything we can do be, as well as everybody. If you don't know what you want to do, just say yes to any opportunity that comes up. Try it, and then you'll know. Know what the unknown is. Um, I remember in high school, the mainstream high school, I was scared, but the interpreter said, I had a great interpreter in high school. She said, go ahead. You're smart. You can do anything. Get involved with all the different activities. I said, no, 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 and the interpreter uh, like the teacher would ask a question and the interpreter would would say something for me, because, but I didn't want to say anything. And the instructor said, you're right. You're right, Rick. You're correct. And the interpreter knew that I would say what I would say. And the interpreter would answer for me. I hadn't even signed anything and the interpreter voiced for me. And that happened more often. And my confidence grew. People uh, began to uh, make me feel more confident. Once I graduated RIT, the teacher would came, come to me and assign to me an ASL. All the classes were, you know, I was so nervous about going to those classes. I had tests and homework and I had, I felt I was the same as the hearing students. They wrote like me. They did math like me. Actually, I was better at it. I didn't have that lack of in, of confidence i wasn't insecure anymore if you don't know then go and find out what to know and i've come a long way i have a comfortable life i have different things every day things i still don't know but i keep pressing forward you know deaf and hard of hearing youth if you don't know what to do the world needs all of you the world needs to see deaf and hard of hearing people be amazing just keep going and things will open up for you. You're amazing. This panel has been great. Uh, hearing people will kind of look at you, but oh, look at all these wonderful people. We, we are all the same. We are all equal. It's important. Just go ahead and do it. That's my little spiel. Wonderful, Rick. Thank you so much for your story. This is Angela speaking. Um, I've been watching chat and I haven't seen any questions come through just yet, but we are here for another four minutes if there are any questions that come up. Um, but just wanted to take the time as we're waiting for people to type in any questions they might have to thank all of our panelists so much for their time, um, for sharing their most excellent stories. This really has been a pleasure. Um, I do see that Dwayne has a question. Um, Dwayne, can you throw it into chat for us? Um, but real quick, thank you, everybody. Um, we are now starting to get questions. So from Misty Dawn, for those of you working for others, did you find it hard to find employers that would give you a chance? We'll start with Noel. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah. For those of you working for others, did you find it hard to find employers that would give you a chance?
You mean working with others, other people who so, are here? Angela, to clarify, if um, you're working at like under an employer, do you have multiple coworkers, you have a boss versus being like self-employed? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. Like dealing with discrimination or being oppressed as a deaf person in the workplace. Is that what you mean? Yeah, uh, speaking. Uh, yes, that is one big challenge in the deaf community. Self-advocacy is needed. You have to continue to self-advocate and fight for your accessibility needs, accommodations. Even though the ADA is there, it's still, you know, many people don't know uh, the rights of people with disabilities. Uh, some, some people don't will just accept it, but if you self-advocate, you're actually working for the next person who comes along who is, has a disability. We're gonna to toss it over to Daniel. And just for the panelists to know, we have two minutes. So we are gonna, we're gonna answer this as quickly as possible. Luckily, it's the only question. It is hard for deaf people to get access into a company because people typically will be nervous or scared that they're not able to communicate. And so they will be like, oh, um, how am I going to communicate with somebody who's deaf or hard of hearing or deaf blind? So really having the individual of the deaf person have that skill that they're able to kind of put forth and show like that we can do it. Some people still have the stigma that deaf people can't drive. We can drive. And so really showing that we have the skill. And that's why it is so important for internships and for internships to provide that at least step in the right direction to get us access. So then we can really advance from there. Angela speaking, we got a lot of thank yous from the, from the chat. Um, and I saw Rick raise his hand. So we're gonna jump to Rick real quick because we've got one last minute. In my job, if I didn't do well, many people would lose their jobs because if there weren't enough students and teachers would be laid off. So that means I was responsible as the vice president of, a, of admission. So I was concerned as a deaf person. I knew to communicate with many people who were concerned and I had to be assertive. I said, don't worry about me. I'm going to be fine. I'm a deaf person, but I know my, my worth. And they felt uh, really, it really was uh, communication that was important. Noel. This is Noel. I just want to have a brief, uh, it's sad to say, but yes, we as deaf people were considered lifetime educators. For example, we get emotionally exhausted. Uh, we're always educating the world about deaf people and it can that's not the fun part but you know it's half of the bridge you know we have to make a position so that we're in a place where we can change the world and educate people okay and jason says i agree with noel this is angela speaking Thank you panelists for all your time. This again has been recorded. It will be posted for people to be able to watch later on. I wanted to let the panelists know that there are so many thank yous coming in from our audience of people thanking you for sharing your stories. Um, it seems that there was a, a pretty strong impact. So many, many thanks from DVR for you guys joining on this crazy idea that we had. And then many, many thanks from our audience as well. Thank you, everybody, so much. All right, to respect everybody's time, we are one minute Thank over. You. Thank this you. This will be posted to Facebook. Everyone take care and have a wonderful evening.